House of the Lord with you this morning. We have a lot of stuff coming up this week in particular, um, and, and a couple of corrections in the bulletin. Um, the Easter flowers were due last week, so disregard that first announcement. Um, but ham sandwich order orders are due today, and they can be picked up on uh, the 23rd. And thank you to everyone who uh, took those order forms home or to work and, or, and sold uh, to other people. Uh, your contributions will certainly help our, our missions committee. And, um, and this, is, this will be a little bit of a surprise, but if I could meet the mission committee after church today, I, I'd like to talk about something. So, if you're on the missions committee, please uh, just see me after church. Today we also have our Bible study this evening at 6.30. Uh, I invite all of you that are reading through the book, The Way. Uh, join us this evening. Uh, we have a video and discussion and, and Bible study. Um, and we have, uh, I think we have some good conversations. So if you, if you are interested in that and, and you didn't get a book but you are still interested, I invite you to come and, and at least watch the video and, and join in the Bible study with us. And there is choir practice on Wednesday night. And Thursday night is our third Thursday of the month. So that means that we will have a prayer service here uh, from 6 until 7 o'clock. Um, we're going to do a little bit, something a little bit different at prayer service this month. So um, you might, might want to come in and join us and see what we're, see what we're up to. Uh, as we pray for our community and our church and, of course, our world. And uh, then on Saturday, we will have our spaghetti dinner. And that is from 4.30 till 7. Uh, you can come at any time. You don't have to show up at 4.30. Uh, and I saw in the refrigerator, it looks like we're, we're prepa preparing for a lot of meat sauce. So... So please come and, and help us eat some spaghetti and just uh, enjoy some games. I'll have some games there for for all ages. So if you have kids or grandkids that would be interested in that, um, of course, uh, there's very few people I know that do not like spaghetti. So please come out and, and just be in fellowship. And if you know someone that's in need of a, a good hot meal, uh, this would be a perfect opportunity to invite them uh, because um, the cost is, of course, by donation, so you can give whatever you feel like giving to help offset the cost. And then you see there that we are also looking for plastic eggs and wrapped candy. So if you would, if you would like to donate that towards our Easter egg hunt, you can bring it, bring it in on on a Sunday and. Um, We'll find a place to drop it off, probably over in the, over there on the back table or something. Do you want the eggs pre-stuffed with candy? It doesn't matter. Okay. If they want to, that's fine. All right. If not, if you want to stuff eggs with candy, you can. If you don't want to do the stuffing and you just want to donate either eggs or candy, <laughs> you, you can do that. And then I know that last week we sent out, um, or we gave out these. I have one correction to be, to be made on this flyer, and it's for the Easter breakfast. That is totally free. You don't have to bring anything. I made a mistake and said it was potluck, but the potluck is on home Sunday, on the second, uh, after church. So bring something for that, but Easter Sunday, just come and, and, and be prepared to eat. Breakfast. I, I hear it's a it's a heck of a spread for breakfast. Andrew. Yeah. Just to let you know, on here it says the Easter egg hunt's going to be at eleven thirty. The signs are going to say eleven, so that may be a little bit confusing. Okay. So is it is that eleven? So another correction. I really need a proofreader. <laughs> I know when I when I type up the newsletter, Jessica gets on me and she says, "Let me proofread that before you send it." 
But it, it's all it's good to have a group. Any other announcements? Yeah. Yeah, if you are interested in joining the women's group, uh, we're going to have a meeting on the 26th after church. And it will be a kind of preliminary plan and, and just a, um, I don't want to say it's a revival, I guess, of the women's group. Uh, because I, the, the women's group continued to, to work, but I don't think they have met, I don't know, Nancy, Pat. Well, about seven years. That was about seven years. Okay. Has it been that long? So, you and I are leaving all the time. So, if you are a woman, we would invite you on the 26th. And I, I, I joke with, with Jessica and the other women. As pastor of the church, I am a member of the women's group. <laughs> that doesn't mean that I am a woman. But, but I will be there at the meeting. So, just so you can't talk about it. <laughs> okay. Seeing that we have gotten through the business of the church this morning, let us now turn our hearts over to the real reason that we have gathered together this morning, which is to worship a risen Lord and Savior. So let us quiet our hearts and our minds and ourselves as the light of Christ is brought in to the sanctuary, and the prelude is played for us.
uh, turn to the in the back of your hymnal to page number one or eight fourteen, where the reading of our Psalter, which comes from Psalms ninety five. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us sing a joyful voice to the God of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us sing a joyful voice to the songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth and also the heights of the mountains. The sea belongs to God who made it, and the dry land because of God formed it. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us appeal before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God. We are the people of God's pasture, the sheep of God's hands. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. You may be seated. Worshippers must worship in, the, in spirit and truth. 
the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I send you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just, what, just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world, the word of God for the people of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, may the words that you have placed on my heart today and the words that come from my mouth be pleasing to you. May your word be heard this morning and your word be spoken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, I would invite you to just keep it you have your Bibles open already, to keep your Bibles open here to John chapter 4, verses 4, 5 through 42, because this is a quite extensive story that I'm sure I could probably preach on the Samaritan woman for days. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and, and, and get you out of here before our Bible study tonight. <laughs> But as we see here, and I thank my, I didn't know my mom was the reader today, but I thank her for, for reading it because I thought, man, whoever's going to have this reading is probably going to hate me <laughs> for having to read so much. But she's my mother, so she can't hate me. <laughs> <laughs> but it is this, an interesting conversation that, that takes place between not only Jesus and the Samaritan woman, but also uh, the disciples, and, and sometimes we even gloss over that the the, uh, the fact that the disciples returned, and and uh, they were probably good Methodists because they were concerned about food, right? And uh, um, there was a another pastor that I saw uh, that made a joke about that it took twelve men to go grocery shopping that day, and so. <laughs> So we see that Jesus is alone at the well, and, and this Samaritan woman comes to draw water. 
And as you may recall from last week, we looked at a similar conversation that Jesus had. If you remember, Nicodemus was a religious leader. And he had come in the cover of darkness to have a conversation with Jesus. And even though the conversations with Jesus are similar between the Samaritan woman and Nicodemus, they really could not be any more opposite of people. But we see that they both are in need of what? They're both in need of a Savior, aren't they? So we see this woman here comes to the well in the middle of the day. And as you know, the middle of the day would have probably been the hottest part of the day. And it's interesting that she, cho she chooses this time of day to come. And we can kind of see that she is probably doing this for the purpose of avoiding the judgment of others. Because she carries with her not only her, her jugs for water, but she carries with her feelings of shame or disgrace. Her life is opposite of that of a religious leader like Nicodemus who would have been proud of keeping the law and appearing to keep the law. We got into that a little bit in Sunday school this morning. You see, religious leaders of the day, they were also guilty of breaking the law, but they wouldn't let you know it. You see, their, their outward appearance made them appear that they did all of the right things and that they were with the right people. And that they kept all of the right commandments. And in fact, keeping the law consumed them. But they had failed to love God and love one another. So this woman with her broken past and Nicodemus, with his self-righteousness, come to Jesus. And their past does not prevent Jesus from confronting both of them with what they have done. We also see a difference in reactions to Jesus' claim that he is the promised Messiah, don't we? Jesus calls to each of them to follow him. And yet, both of them can choose different paths. So, after hearing that the Pharisees are really kind of after him for, for this being guilty of making believers of other people, and, and his disciples were baptizing many in his name, Jesus decides to return to Galilee. And when you travel from, when you're traveling to Galilee, he has to come by the way of the land of Samaria. And he comes into this Samaritan city called Sychar. As our scripture reading picks up here in John 4, verse 5. So it being in the middle of the day and traveling by foot all day, Jesus is probably a little overheated and very thirsty. And so he goes to this well that is known as Jacob's well, which is significant to who Jesus is. A well in those days and in the days of Jacob, would have been vital for life in that region. It would have watered livestock, 
and, and the crops and those living on the land. This deep well was believed to be either dug by Jacob himself or Jacob's people, and it ran down to the bedrock so that it would be very deep and that it would never run dry. As we all know, water is vital to life, isn't it? Here we are in the middle of Lent, on our third Sunday of Lent, and there are many things that we can give up, right? We can even give up physical food and other things and have not very much difficulty surviving, but if we were to forgive up, if we were to give up water, we wouldn't last very long, would we? And this is because the body needs water for nearly every process. Our bodies are mostly made up of water. It is important for us to remain hydrated. And so Jesus, being fully man, needs some water to drink. And verse 8 says that his disciples, they go off to town to buy food, and Jesus goes to this well. And along comes a Samaritan woman at a time that would be usual, would be unusual for women to draw water. Typically, the, the women would have gone in the cool of the day in the afternoon to draw water for their households. And it would have been a time that the women got together just as our women's group is looking to meet. It is a good time for women to get together and, and talk, right, and catch up on the news of the day or what went, went on in town. And most likely there was probably a little bit of gossiping that went on at that well. And as we learn later in this passage, this woman is probably the subject of some of that talk. And so to avoid the shame that others bring upon her, the shame that her past brings upon her, she decides to go at a time of day when there'd be a chance that no one would be at the well. And not much has really changed in our day, has it? There are people in our community that we are guilty of looking down on. I know that I am guilty of trying to avoid certain people. And certainly we can get caught up in the gossip of the day and, and what this person did or what this person looks like or what they have or don't have. There are those around us that are like this woman that feels like the outcast of society. Who are the people that we whisper about? And yet Jesus shows us a different way of how we should treat those people. Jesus ignores the social norms of the day. So as a Jewish man, he should not be talking to a Samaritan woman. She is, after all, a, a woman alone, and he is a man alone, and, and that would have been taboo in the day. And it's still, uh, today, part of Jewish tradition that, that 
They don't talk to each other alone. And then the fact that he was Jewish and she was a, a different race, they would not have been talking to each other. Samaritans were considered half-breeds by the Jews. They were the offspring of the Jews that were left behind during the captivity and the people that the Assyrians sent into the land to really dilute the culture of the people that lived there. And there were other reasons why Jews and Samaritans did not get along. For one reason, the Samaritans desecrated the temple by releasing a herd of pigs through it. And they also decided to change their holy scriptures so that they were called to worship God in a different place on Mount Gerizim instead of on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So the Jewish people would not have considered Samaritans as people. And so the woman cannot believe that Jesus, a Jew, is talking to her, asking her, a Samaritan woman, to draw him water. But Jesus says to her that above that, if she even knew who was asking her this question, that she would ask him for living water. Seeing that he had nothing to draw with, she did not know what he meant. How could he draw water from this living well? with nothing to draw with. Knowing that the well was deep, but provided the essential element of life, she wanted to know where she could get this living water. And in hearing Jesus' explanation about what the water he offers could do, that those who partake will not thirst again and would have eternal life, the woman really wants that kind of water. Either so she may never be thirstier again, or perhaps it's because she is getting tired of coming to the well in the middle of the day to draw water. We see here in verse 16 that Jesus confronts the woman with her past as well as showing her that he knew that she was living with a man who was not her husband. And in fact, she had been married five times before. <clears throat> and so then we see the probable source of why she avoided the other women in town. And why she was there at a time that she met Jesus at the well that day. And then she sees that this is not just another Zionist Jew, but is someone who is sent from God. She confesses that she believes that the Messiah would come, but wanted to know where she was to go and worship this God. Jesus tells her that a time would come when we will worship God wherever we are. That it won't matter which mountain that we are on. And her confession here and desire to know where to worship God isn't just a question to trip Jesus up. I'm sure... In her day, she had met many Jews who had come and, and told the Samaritans that they were worshiping on the wrong mountain. That the only place to worship was in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And 
Jesus says to her that he is the Messiah. Making his first I am statement in John 4, 26. Acknowledging that he is God, which is a divine claim to make. A reply to her confession that she knows that a Messiah was coming and that his name would be called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. The woman who was an outcast and a sinner becomes really the first evangelist because Jesus told her about herself. He knew her intimately before she even met him. And so she goes back into town and she tells those people that are probably talking about her that she had met the Messiah. And of course, the disciples returning from their grocery shopping Ask Jesus, why are you talking to her? They probably wondered, why would you speak to a woman like that? A Samaritan woman. A woman who comes in the middle of the day to draw water. Someone who obviously is avoiding other people for a reason. They are probably believing that Jesus is not thinking very straight here because he had not eaten any food. So they do the first thing they think of, which is offering food to eat. Perhaps he's delirious. But like the living water that he offered to the woman, he tells the disciples that he has food which they know nothing about. His food is to do the will of God. His word is feeding those who are starved for salvation, whether they be Jews or Samaritans. The religious elite or the lowest of people. You see, the Samaritan woman, she did not know Jesus that well, nor did she know all the things that he taught or all the miracles that he performed, yet she believes that he is her Messiah because of what he did for her through this life-giving water that he offered her. And so our scripture lesson from the Gospel of John concludes that he stays with these people from town that have come to see this man who, this woman, told them about. And it says that he feeds them with his teaching. And he offers them living water. And they believe. If we look back to the Old Testament in Exodus 17, we see that God's people were thirsty for water as they wandered through the wilderness. They began to grumble and complain, fearing death. And they say, why did you bring us out of Egypt, Moses, to this place with no food or no water? To kill us? To kill our children? To kill our livestock? They quickly forgot that they were in the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And just because they were thirsty, they then were looking back and were saying, well, Egypt really wasn't that bad, was it? We were enslaved, but at least they offered us water. Now we're wandering through this wilderness with nothing to eat or drink. And I think sometimes we're like that too, wandering. 
wandering through our own wilderness, forgetting what God has brought us through, looking back at our past and saying, well, it wasn't that bad, was it? God's people in Exodus 17 were so angry at Moses, they were ready to stone him. So Moses did what he knew what to do in these situations, which was to turn to God. And so he cries out for, to the Lord for help. And God tells Moses to go and strike a rock and water would come forth from that rock. And the, and the people would be able to drink and live. And now we see Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus, our rock, our redeemer. <coughs> Offering living water. And he offers it to, to all who, who cry out to God. God comes and seeks after us. And so on this third Sunday in Lent, you see here that I have placed a rock on the altar which is a, a, a nice rock that comes the whole way from Maine. And it's a, a piece of granite from Cadillac Mountain in Maine. If you've ever been there, it is, it is one of the, the places that it, it just overwhelms you with beauty and you feel close to God. But I picked a rock because we can do a lot of things with rocks, can't we? We can build things. I'm sure Jacob's well was dug down to bedrock and it was probably lined with rock. But what else can we do with rocks? We can pick them up and we can throw them at people. <laughs> right? We can be like those in Exodus that wanted to stone Moses. And those that probably would have looked at the Samaritan woman and said, and she's been married five times. She's living with a man who's not her husband. We should stone her. And yet this rock named Jesus comes along. And out of this rock comes living water. So this week during Lent, I want you to think, what are you using your rocks for? And who is the rock that you stand on? I pray that your rock is Jesus Christ, which that living water comes out of. So that we can offer it to everyone. Not just to those who are the religious elite or the rich and well off, but to the, the poor to those that are sinners, to those people that we might pick up a rock and cast at, maybe not physically, but through our words or even our actions of trying to avoid them. Go and show them that from this rock that this church stands on comes forth living water. Let us now pray Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for our, our rock and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who offers us living water that redeems us, who offers us food through his word. 
so that those who hear it may believe. Lord God, we lift up all of our joys and our concerns to you today. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for Jenna's healing and for her release from the hospital that she may be home again on this mountain with us. Lord, we pray for those that are in need of, of healing and we give you thanks for Doug's healing and, and for those that have experienced healing in many different forms. And may they use those as examples to be like the Samaritan woman to go and, and tell others about what God has done for them. And Lord God, we lift up those that are in need today. For Bob and Gloria Eves, Cheryl Anders, Anna May, we lift up the family of Pete Lucas, for Jim Boyer. We lift up Jake and Tanya, Ann Harsh, Jane Grossnickel, Doris Kaufman, Shirley, Billy, Donna Draper, Kyle and Erica, Jim, Judy, Anne Marie, we lift up Mike and Siegfried and Holzer, Tom Preston, Scott and Angela. We lift up Bubba, David, and Loretta, Dot McAfee, Wanda, and those that have lost loved ones the past week, Lord. For those that have experienced feelings of being outcast. Lord God, let us be a light in a dark world. Let us shine truth where there are lies. And Lord, let us always give thanks for our Savior who came to earth to redeem us. And we remember him as we remember the prayer he taught us to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you are able to sing our next hymn, number 127, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. <laughs>
Please be seated. I would invite the ushers to come forward and uh, as we prepare to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings this morning. <laughs>
was asked, did you go from this place today, standing on the rock, and pouring out the water that gives us life, and share the word which feeds us, go now in peace. Amen. Thank you.